right, Mary, can you hear me okay? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our uh, webinar this evening. Um, my name is Dee Marsh, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Brewster Conservation Trust. I help with admin and do outreach and communication. Um, for those of you that might not be familiar with Brewster Conservation Trust, I'd like to just take a minute to tell you a little bit more about us. We were established in 1983 as a nonprofit charitable organization supported by membership donations and grants. Our mission is to preserve open space, natural resources, and the rural character of Brewster, and to promote a conservation ethic. Since, in, since its founding 38 years ago, BCT has helped protect more than 200 parc of parcels of environmentally important land, totaling more than 1,400 acres. We actively manage several of our properties and have opened them to the public for hiking, birding, and other passive recreation activities. BCT also hosts several events each year from our annual Brewster Conservation Day to walks and talks like the one you're about to enjoy. We have two and a half full-time equivalent staff and a very engaged board of 15 volunteer trustees and numerous other volunteers helping with land stewardship activities. All our work is made possible by your support, so thank you. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I just wanna go over a few things on our webinar, which I think you will all be familiar with by now. Um, you've all been muted and your camera's off. You can use the Q&A feature to type in your questions as opposed to the chat feature. You'll find that down on your menu bar. This webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it or share it. Um, you'll be able, you'll, you'll receive that link in just a few days. And we'll also put it up on our website under the videos tab. And it's saying a short survey is going to be launched, but I don't believe there is one, so that is not correct. Um, so let me just quickly introduce Mary. Um, Mary Doucette, as I think most of you know, is Brewster Conservation Trust and Wellfleet Conservation Trust AmeriCorps Cape Cod member for this year. Um, and she was Brewster Conservation Trust summer intern for 2019 and 2020. Mary holds a Bachelor of Arts in both environmental studies and sociology. Um, and she's, we are just really, really grateful to have her at Brewster Conservation Trust. She's done a phenomenal job the past almost three years now with us. So I will turn it over to you, Mary. Thanks, Dee. Okay, let me share my screen and present. Can you see it? Is it good? Okay, I'm going to talk about the social construction of nature. So just a little bit about uh, me. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, like Dee said, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies and Sociology from Eckerd College. I just graduated a little over a year ago now. Um, and I was the BCT summer intern for 2019 and 2020, and I'm currently in AmeriCorps Cape Cod year 20. And those are my two dogs. So the outline of this uh, talk is I'm going to first start off by talking about the social construction theory in terms of general sociology, just to give a little bit of background and kind of help people understand more about what it really is and how it can be applied to general things. And then I'm going to focus more on how it can be applied to the social construction of nature. And then from there, I'm gonna talk about common paradigms. There's two common paradigms that are kind of prevailing for the last, since the rise of society, I guess. Um, <laughs> and then I'll talk about the role of technology and use an applied example to kind of demonstrate how all of these things I'll be talking about kind of come together to socially construct nature. And then I'll kind of give some background on why is this important? Why am I talking about this tonight? And then we'll have time for some questions. So social construction theory was first popularized in 1966 by uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman when they published their book, The Social Construction of Reality. And so the kind of general overarching theme of it is that people and groups interact in social systems 
And those interactions help form uh, abstract principles, concepts, representations, and those all become normalized and habituated into daily life. And then um, they kind of just could become part of culture. And so to sum that up, we attach meaning to characteristics and objects, typically um, things that are intangible, so they don't have a physical form. And a lot of these common things that we apply social construction theory to are, um, you know, like gender, economics, architecture, communication, entertainment, and so much more. You can essentially say that everything is a social construct. Um, and so one big uh, characteristic of the social construction theory is that things change across history and culture. So they're always kind of reconstructing and renegotiating among social groups. And then lastly, this theory opposes essentialism. Um, and so essentialism is the idea that everything is biologically determined and that things are the way they are and they can't change. And there are tons of sociological theories that you can kind of compare uh, all these two, but these two are really kind of in opposition of each other. And so when you talk about social construction theory, you usually uh, use essentialism as kind of like a counter argument for them. Um, and so one example of essentialism versus con social construction is with gender roles. And so traditional American thought is that, you know, women are the homemakers, they're nurturers, they're mothers, um, stay at home moms, that kind of a thing versus men are kind of seen as the breadwinners. And so essentialists say that that's, that is that way because it's biologically determined. You know, women are the ones that give birth, they're nurturing, that kind of a thing. Whereas social construction theory kind of states that we have these identities because of how we're raised and socialized when we're growing up. So uh, girls are treated with more care because they're seen as more delicate. And so they learn a more nurturing role. But you can also see nowadays that this is kind of shifting in that more men are taking on a traditionally feminine role in the family and more women are also taking on a more traditionally masculine role in the family. And so the social construction of nature. So when I talk about the social construction of nature, I'm talking about the socio-cultural realm and the socio-biophysical realm. What are those? Um, so the socio-cultural is more theoretical. So what is natural versus what is unnatural um, can be kind of a good example of the socio-cultural. So if you put in a park in a city, you know, you excavate it, you lay out grass, you do all that. Is that natural or is that unnatural? That's kind of the socio-cultural aspect of that versus the socio-biophysical are things like Forests, rivers, um, they are biological in their entirety, but there's also a social aspect to them in which, you know, we can go out, we can interpret them the way that we want to. Whereas um, the biophysical realm is things that you just can't really argue with, you know, gravity, laws of thermodynamics, you can't really argue that there's a difference for gravity. It just, it is what it is. Um, and so this is all to say that we're not disqualifying hard scientific fact but instead we're using social construction theory to invite social sciences into this conversation and make sense of how, you know, it's not just a biological entity and that we attach meaning to the natural world. And so one big part of this is nature work, which is a term coined by Gary Allen Fine. And it's kind of saying that we constantly work to transform nature into culture. So when you think of a tree, you typically think of, you know, like just a random species that, and that's kind of your default tree in a way. And so when I think of a tree, I might think of something completely different than someone who grew up in the Europe or Africa. Um, so that kind of demonstrates how our cultural idea of a tree is different. And then we construct that image of the tree and we behave accordingly to it. Um, so, Another way you can kind of think about this is with cows um, or other animals, you know, in some religions, cows are super sacred. You can't eat them like you worship them versus in America, like they're going down left and right. Like we factory farm, we don't care as much about them. Um, so there's that cultural difference and we kind of see the cow and interpret it in specific ways based on how we're socialized when we're being brought up. Um, and so nature work occurs really subconsciously in daily life because of this socialization process that is created by whatever society we reside in when we're going through, you know, like childhood, adolescence, young adult, 
pretty much our entire lives. Um, your society will influence you subconsciously and you don't really notice it unless you take a step back and realize and like kind of look at it. Um, so this also adds to creating and maintaining borders between categories. So like humans versus the environment, us versus them, that kind of aspect. And so nature work, the cultural aspect of it kind of creates those borders. So like we see ourselves as different from X, Y, and Z versus a different culture might see themselves different from ABC. And so another aspect of how we know, we can kind of see how uh, the environment has been socially constructed is because environmental views vary across cultures and time. So if we look at, you know, like America, white settlers, um, so they kind of view uh, nature as conquerable and theirs for the taking. Um, they can do what they please. So if you think of like Manifest Destiny, when everyone was moving out west, all the white settlers um, kind of just taking the land for their own and they were kind of kicking out, well, they weren't kind of, they were kicking out indigenous um, people. And so a lot of those indigenous tribes were living in harmony with the land. Um, you know, they, they were using the natural resources, but it was more of an interconnected um, lifestyle that they led as opposed to the dominating nature of the white settlers that were coming in. And so this is how you can see the differences between cultures is that, you know, at the same time, this culture is interacting with nature in one way versus this culture is conquering and taking it for their own. Um, and then you can also see across time, because if you take, for example, the white settlers that I was just talking about, and you look at that compared to environmental attitudes today, it can be kind of different. You know, we aren't necessarily as focused on conquering um, the land. In fact, there's a big push to, you know, return land to indigenous people, kind of give back the land, restore habitats, all that kind of thing. And that's not to say that there isn't people that still believe that like we should control nature. It's just to say that in general, there is more of an, a different attitude um, and a different kind of perception of how we as a society interact with nature. Um, and so, the last thing on the social construction of nature for this page, at least, is the differences between re real and commercialized nature. So this can kind of be seen as in advertisements. If you think about it, nature always looks really pristine. Um, you know, like you'll see commercials where people are hiking and they're perfectly clean. Whereas if you've seen any of us that do land stewardship at the BCT, you look at us and we're covered in dirt and like, it makes sense. Um, <laughs> so in advertisements, or for people who watch advertisements, that's what they perceive as nature. And in general, a lot of people think that, you know, real nature isn't beautiful. Like you think of manicured lawns, uh, that kind of stuff. And so that's one way that we can see that it's been socially constructed because they have this idea of what nature should look like and how it should be this beautiful thing. And then there's a difference. There's a paradox between what nature actually is. Um, so I like to think of those nature valley bar commercials where it's like there's little girls spinning around in a field there's like wild herds running through and like a lot of times like, that's just not you're not going to see that really. Um, plus they never talk about how crummy the literally crummy <laughs> the nature valley bars are. So the common paradigms are human exceptionalism paradigm, also known as uh, human, human exemption, exceptionalism versus uh, human exceptionalist. Those are two kind of names for the same thing. Um, and that kind of talks more about how due to culture, technology, our complicated social organizations, humans are exempt from ecological principles. So we can bend the environment to kind of whatever we want. You know, we can do whatever we want and we're not going to have repercussion because we are above the environment. We're above the natural world. And this kind of started in the medieval and Renaissance period where there was a really high rate of inequality. Um, in fact, agra agrarian societies have some of have the most inequality in comparison to any other type of society. Um, so this shift happened when the upper class kind of wanted to separate themselves from the lower class. So you see a switch from the carnivalesque body to the classical body. The carnivalesque body is the idea that we are connected with nature, like your bodily functions are all natural, they're open, um, no one really cares, it's all very earthy, connected, 
you know, that kind of a thing versus the classical body is more privatized and the body becomes private, bodily functions become very private and shameful even. Um, and this was kind of created as a sign of, to show your status and to show where you are in like the social hierarchy. And so to remove oneself from the common people became essentially to remove yourself from nature. And as time went on and that kind of inequality gap lessened, um, more people took on the classical body because they wanted to be seen as higher class. And so that's why in a lot of ways, we still practice the classical body as opposed to the carnivalesque body. Um, and so we see ourselves as above nature. Nature is shameful in a way versus the new ecological paradigm, which was first proposed by Riley Dunlap, William Catan, and Kent Van Leer in the late 1970s, which is kind of the opposite. It really puts stress on the fact that we are interconnected with nature and we will see repercussions from our actions if we kind of try to bend the environment past its natural limit. Um, you know, we can't escape the fact that we are super entwined with the environment and dependent upon other species for our survival. And a lot of scholars believe um, and argue that we are have shifted into the new ecological paradigm, but it's really hard to measure environmental attitudes. So a lot of sociologists still use the human exceptionalism, human <laughs> exceptionalism paradigm um, as kind of the prevailing idea. On to the role of technology. I love that little picture of the dog. Um, so we are super technologically advanced, getting more technologically advanced every day. And this has created an information surplus and global connectivity. So we're able to see any type of environment just through our screen. Um, we can learn about different species. We can learn about you know, how people around the world are doing land stewardship, conservation. We can learn anything just that the, you know, typing into Google. Um, but this is just, this is under the assumption that someone has access to technology, which is not the case for a lot of the world. Um, there are a lot of nations that do not have the same privilege as we do in America when it comes to um, technology. There's a lot of people in America that don't have the same privileges. Um, and that's something that definitely needs to be acknowledged um, because they are being left out of the global society and having kind of like a voice in it. And so this kind of leads to disembedding, which is a term coined by Anthony Giddens, which is where you have been removed from your immediate environment. So when you're staring at a screen for so long, you kind of don't even realize what room you're in. Um, and that can be the built environment. And then you are even less likely to realize that there is a whole world of real environment right outside your door. Um, and this kind of disembedding from the environment has led to a lot of things. Like if you look at, a lot of younger um, kids right now, they're growing up with iPads and staring at screens all day and that kind of you know stuff. They're very technologically advanced. They could probably you know figure out how to make a PowerPoint faster than I could and get it done and be good to go. <laughs> um, so a lot of sociologists are asking the question, well, how is this going to affect our relationship with nature in the future? If this generation is being brought up with technology and not going outside as much, what's going to be the role of the environment in the future? How is this going to change? How is it going to reconstruct how society views nature, interacts with nature, all of that? Um, and I think that'll be really interesting to see and to like look at the research on that in a few years. And then um, this is also under the assumption that children have access to nature because in a lot of cases, like in cities, they don't actually have that same access to nature as, for example, I do, where I could walk outside and be in the woods. Um, and so another kind of uh, point that I wanted to pose is that the relationship between technology, the environment, and this pandemic. So during this pandemic, people have been staring at screens all day. <laughs> um, and there has actually been a really big surge in people kind of connecting with nature and getting outside because they're just sick and tired of staring at screens and they need to find things that they can do. And a lot of people have turned to trails and going to different restoration areas um, and getting more involved with the natural world. And so that was such a quick reconstruction between pre-pandemic and during pandemic that it'll be really interesting to see what happens post-pandemic 
um, whether this kind of trend will continue or whether people will go back to how they were originally perceiving nature. And so time for the applied example. So Iron Mountain is a city um, in Michigan. It's along the uh, Menominee River. And this example comes from a sociological analysis called Beyond the Nature Society Divide, Learning to Think Like a Mountain by William Freudenberg, Scott Frickle, and Robert Gramling. And um, so the Iron Mountain typically nowadays refers to a single peak on a ridge along the river, but um, sociological you know, scholars and historically it refers to the entire ridge. So that's how I'm going to be referring to it. Um, so when I say Iron Mountain, I'm referring to the entire ridge. So you can kind of use this case study as a way to show how uh, nature has been socially constructed because of the different phases that it has gone under. And so the first phase was it was a hunting ground and a living space for the Menominee uh, tribe. And they saw it as very sacred because of the religion that they practiced was animistic. And so everything has value, everything is powerful. And they kind of lived uh, sustainably off the land. Like they took resources that they needed, but they didn't overconsume, and they understood the balance between the human environmental interaction. And then the second phase is where the white settlers come in in the early 1800s. They see all these trees and their culture tells them that this environment, the way that they interact with this is that they use that for timber. And that's the value that the mountain has. And so this kind of dichotomy shows the difference between cultures. And so at the same time, the Menominee is seeing it as sacred, whereas the white settlers that are coming in are seeing it as more an economic game because they have, you know, they have more capital intensive and industrial views of the environment. Um, and then the third phase switches to a source of iron ore. And the white settlers knew that there was iron ore when they came there in the early 1800s, but they didn't start using it as a source of iron ore until the late 1800s. And so the reason that they started using it as a source of iron ore is because technology was advancing. Um, and so there we can see how technology kind of plays into the social, social construction of nature, because as technology advances, what they wanted from the land changed. They no longer needed timber, they needed um, supplies to make steel. And so then a few decades after mining, the iron ore mines start to close. And it wasn't even because they had run out of uh, resources, there were still plenty of iron ore supplies. Um, it was more so because of socio-physical competition in that there were more convenient locations to mine and there were different developments in steel production. So it became just a physical area and there was really no social value to it until the 1950s or so when people started going there as a tourist attraction, they started opening mine tours and gift shops and in the winter people would go skiing there. So all of these phases kind of highlight a different aspect of what I've been talking about. The phase one and phase uh, two show the difference between cultures. All five phases can show the difference between, or the four phases can show the difference between, uh, you know, white settlers and their interaction with the uh, Iron Mountain. So it went from a source of timber to a source of, they used it for iron ore to then they were using it recreationally. So the way that they interacted with that specific environment changed over a period of time, even though it was the same culture because they socially had a different understanding of what they wanted from it. And then you can also see the human exceptionalist paradigm and kind of the new ecological paradigm at work here too, because the indigenous people that were there had more of a, they practiced more of the new ecological paradigm where they understood that they were connected with nature. They couldn't push beyond the limits. Whereas the white settlers that came in practiced the human exceptionalist paradigm where they thought that they were above land. They didn't care if the resources were gonna run out um, because you know it's for them, it's for their taking. Um, so that kind of demonstrates all of the different types of um, things that I've just been talking about into one nice little example. And so why am I even talking about this? Why is this important? 
So this is really important to kind of think about and have as a tool in your pocket when you're kind of reflecting um, because of the insanely dynamic nature of social construction theory and of you know how society interacts with things. So if society attaches meaning to the environment and it's constantly changing, that means that if we want people and society to have a more conservation-minded you know, belief system, we have to construct social ideologies that will reflect that and will kind of lead us to that goal. So we need to do nature work and we need to turn nature into culture and have it be for our benefit. Um, and so if there's an us versus nature mindset, that's not gonna get done. Um, so it's gonna be a lot harder to conserve land and keep doing conservation work if there's still that human exceptionalist paradigm. We need to kind of push more towards the new ecological paradigm. And then another thing is that it's it can be really helpful in a critical analysis of our own relationship with nature in that if we're able to kind of use this theory as a way to reflect upon ourselves, we can look at, you know, how, how has my upbringing influenced how I interact with nature? How have I been conditioned to, you know, behave accordingly to X, Y, and Z things in nature? Um, and then the last thing is that the social construction theory, I have found that it is really one of the only theories that allows for hope, um, you know, because essentialists don't think that there's anything we can do. They think it's all biologically determined and we can't change anything. But the social construction theory, because it's always changing and you're able to shape society to what the people want and how the social um, systems interact, you know, you can, you can really shape it into something else. So if we want to see a more environmentally friendly future, we have that potential if we're looking at it through the social construction theory versus any other theory really is kind of not as hopeful. Um, so that's something that I've really appreciated about social construction theory and why I think it was really important for me to kind of present this information to all of you too. So like if we keep pushing for a more environmentally friendly future, social construction theory says that we can do it and we can get there and we can you know make these changes that will influence next generations and will help better the planet. Questions? <laughs> That looks great, Mary. Um, we do not have any questions on the Q&A right now. I have a few questions while um, folks are thinking about questions maybe. Um, you can stop sharing the screen. Yeah. And As I'm if gonna... anyone wants the sources okay. that I used, uh, I can send those to D. Yeah, I will share those sources uh, when I share the video. So. Um, and I'm just gonna get myself back on screen if I can. There we go, great. So I had a few questions, that was great, Mary. It was really clear. I um, have to tell you, I went into this and did some research to try and understand it more. And even reading a bunch of, of Google, Google <laughs> results, you did a much better job of explaining this. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. All right, so one question is coming through. How does gender work with SCT? Oh, don't get me started on this one. Um, so gender works with social construction theory because you know, if you look at gender, it has changed over culture, it's changed over time. If you look at, you know, gender roles in like the 1950s look very much different than gender roles now. Now we have um, kind of a more acceptance of different genders besides the traditional male and female, um, you know, man and woman. There's now non-binary individuals. There's a whole umbrella, you know, of different genders that you can kind of identify with. And so social construction theory kind of states that the way that we're socialized and brought up um, is what, you know, that's what has created these gender roles. Um, so like little girls are brought up wearing pink, they're brought up, you know, playing with dolls. And this isn't, you know, like saying that like everyone is, this is in general, um, sociologically speaking, those have been the trends for the past couple decades, for the past couple centuries, is that the, you know, people are assigned a gender at birth and they're brought up accordingly. So that's kind of how gender 
there's a lot of research on that. <laughs> Um, if you want any suggestions, uh, you can reach out and I can send you some articles. Okay. Another question, does any of this theory connect with how society is led and governed, how it decides on or migrates between governance systems and how it decides what it wants within those systems? That's a really good question. Um, so, Social construction theory kind of says that, you know, our, the way that we behave as a society is based on, or what we value as a society is based on the collective of the people that make it up and the, you know, what kind of roles we want to see and how we shape those roles. So you could argue that it definitely has an impact on, you know, how politics work, how we are governed, because, you know, if you look at, say, let me think of a, Good example of this. Um, hmm. If you look at, I can't come up with a solid example. I'm so sorry, but um, it definitely does have to do with you know how you can apply it to how we're governed, um, because you know people wouldn't be making laws if it was you know, they're making laws and policies that are based on our belief system and our kind of values. And so those values have been shaped by, you know, how we as a society have constructed them. To, I don't know if this is making any sense. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you can apply them, you can apply them. Um, policy and government wasn't really my strong suit in college, um, but I hope, you, yeah, you can apply them. <laughs> okay. Um Next question, let's see, you kind of addressed this, but this person's asking, how do you think the pandemic has impacted the social construction of nature and people's relationship with nature? Yeah, so I mean, just through, you know, working as the BCT intern last summer and seeing that difference, um, and then through my year of AmeriCorps seeing the difference, I have definitely noticed a lot more people being really engaged in nature and uh, more supportive of the environmental movement because they have, you know, they either have all this free time or they're sick of looking at a screen and they want to do something new. So they go out and they explore nature and they realize, wow, I never knew that this was in my own backyard. Like I want to get more into this. Um, and so I think a lot of more environmental attitudes have come or positive environmental attitudes have come out of the pandemic because people have more ability to step outside and take advantage of the natural world around them. Um, and whether or not that kind of continues past the pandemic will be really interesting to see. Um, I definitely, you know, I know a lot of people that have really gotten into the environment um, and have kind of shown that they're going to continue acting accordingly through, you know, when the pandemic is over. Um, so it's definitely shaped people's attitudes and people have reshaped attitudes just because they have this new ability to get outside and explore and make these connections that they maybe weren't able to before because they were stuck in an office or stuck, you know, doing something else that didn't allow them the time to. Well, let's see, what would be a really helpful way to connect, I'm sorry, what would be a really helpful way to socially construct the environment in the future? Hopeful or helpful? Hopeful, you mentioned that, that it was one of the hopeful, it was, you know, one of the positive ways to look at the future. Yeah, so um, I think that a really hopeful way to kind of use social construction theory is being able to kind of, you know, use it as like, okay, if I want to see this change, like, how can I make, I'm going to be able to make this change if there's enough support. So, you know, things that people can do are just, you know, raising awareness of environmental issues helps spread um, positive environmental attitudes, educating uh, children, whether they're your own or maybe relatives, friends, that kind of a thing, um, on how to have a more environmentally friendly mindset, help to spread, you know, the socially constructed beliefs um, that you want to see. So if you're able to kind of spread a positive message um, and make change in like a local community by, you know, really encouraging people to you know, look at the environment and understand why we need to protect it, um, then, you know, if you start locally, you can grow into bigger things. So then 
those ideas will spread. And if it's being done across like the nation or the globe from a local um, point and gains momentum, then you know, you're able to reconstruct the ideologies that society has. I was out on a walk with Beth Finch, one of the Brewster Conservation Trustees, and um, she was doing a walk at Eddie's sisters and talking about the history um, and the history of the land, but also the ecology of the land and the biology of the land. And um, she said something that really stuck with me and it said, you know, when people learn about the land that they're walking on, a trail that they may have walked a hundred times, but they learn something about it it makes them feel connected just the way you, when you learn something about another human being, you feel connected and that connection stays. Um, so, yeah. So I think it's making, helping people find those real connections to nature, not just saying go out and take a walk, but also helping them learn mm -hmm. what the tree is that they're looking at or, you know, why we do the things we do with uh, conservation. Uh, a few more questions. Has this been connected to and measures of human happiness? And do we know where the kingdom of Bhutan is on the spectrum of social theory? I can honestly say I do not know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna lie. I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, there, there was a lot of articles um, that I read um, in the Atlantic and other magazines and newspapers during the pandemic, you know, with scientific studies about people that would go out in nature and how it would mm -hmm. um, physically change a person and make it so they're healthier or happier or et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know how it relates to the social construction of nature. Um, let's see, um, has this been connected to any measures? Oh, that was a different one, okay. All right, I think we answered that. So I don't think we have any other questions. You answered all my questions. Um, people already. Well, thank you, Mary. Thanks everybody for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. And um, we'll send a follow-up email with those references. Um, and uh, thanks everybody, have a good night. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Thank you for right. letting me speak. All right, bye. Bye.